Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us as we continue the story of Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Eye for an Eye, by Casey Nash. Chapter 4 Jubal walked into the hotel in San Angelo to find his sleeping clerk with his head resting on his arms, which were folded atop the counter and snoring. He cleared his throat but got no response until he tapped the small silver bell just a few inches from the man's head. When the clapper struck the bell, the man snapped to attention. Yeah, yes, sir, he answered in a loud voice, a bit embarrassed that he was asleep on the job. What can I do for you? The name affixed to his shirt read Sam. I'd like a room for the night and a place to stall my horse. Jubal pulled back his coat unintentionally revealing his badge, reached in his pocket, and pulled out some money. Glad to oblige you, General, replied the scrawny gent with sleepy eyes and a thin black mustache. He threw his hand to the rim of his spectacles and adjusted them over his nose. With a big smile, he continued, If you stay with us two nights, I can give you a discount. Jubal grinned slightly. Thanks, but one night will do. One night it is. Room 12. It's a corner room overlooking the street. Marshal, uh... Jubal didn't answer as he reached for the pen on the counter and scribbled down his name in the ledger facing him. Dealing with nosy hotel clerks wasn't exactly a brand new experience for him. When he finished, the curious man spun the ledger on the turntable and squinted down at the writing. Marshal Jubal Stone, he said in a soft voice with a smile as he looked up from his spectacles. Well, Marshal Stone, what brings you to San Angelo? A train. Jubal answered gruffly as he pulled out his timepiece. Whereabouts is delivery? The clerk hurried out from behind the counter and walked briskly toward the open door, realizing Stone was agitated by his persistent curiosity. Waving his guest over, he pointed. It's two streets up and two to right, Marshal. Looking over his wire-rimmed, thick lens spectacles, he grinned nervously. Tell Everett that Sam sent you. He'll take good care of your horse. Sam glanced down at the hitch. Say, that's a mighty fine-looking mount you got there, Marshal Stone. Frustrated by his loud tone, Jubal whacked his head and stepped around the clerk. He'd hoped to keep a low profile and ease out of town at daybreak undetected, but Sam seemed intent on letting everyone in San Angelo know he was there. Obliged. I'll be back directly. Yes, sir, Marshal. Sam responded again loudly. I'll have your key ready when you return from the livery. He raised a thumb towards his desk as he spoke. Jubal peered angrily over his shoulder at the clerk as he flipped his fender and stirrup over the saddle to tighten his cinch. When finished, he yanked them back into place, gathered his reins, and climbed aboard Red, who was tense and ready to carry his rider. Sir, I'd like to keep it dry that I'm in town, so if it's all the same to you, don't be a-hollering out my name anymore. (laughs) Yes, sir, Marshal, Sam replied nervously, putting his hand to his mouth and lowering his voice. I mean, you, you can count on me. Yeah, I bet I can. Jubal wheeled Red to the right and rode toward the livery. That clerk has a bad case of leaky mouth. I reckon he don't mean no harm, but fellas like him could get a lawman killed. Especially one with a bounty on his head. I aim to get to Sherwood without a bullet in me, hooker by crook. Cautiously, Jubal rode ahead surveilling both sides of the street, reading faces and watching for sudden movements on the ground and up above. With money on his head, he felt like a sitting duck riding through an unfamiliar town, and at night to boot. It was around 10 o'clock, but the boardwalks of San Angelo were full of people, especially as he and Red rode past two of the saloons. Suddenly, he heard the screeching and guttural sounds of cats from the dark alley. As he turned to look, a solid black cat bolted across the street less than two feet in front of Red. The gelding stopped in his tracks and lowered his head to sniff the ground. Easy boy, said Jubal as he clucked to him to go forward. Stone was not the superstitious type but the black cat crossing his path did send a tingle up his spine. He chuckled to himself. Hope that wasn't an omen of worse things to come. He rubbed the tension from his neck and slowly reached down to unlatch his cold. No sooner had that thought crossed his mind than a drunken cowboy yelled from the stoop. Hey, mister, come have a drink. He held up a half-empty bottle of rye as a gesture of his generosity and willingness to share. Jubal paid him no mind, which seemed to anger the fool. He staggered off the stoop and down the steps into the street, 
following closely behind the marshals, swigging down more fire water as he stumbled along. Hey, mister, I'm offering you a drink. Chuckling, he kept at it. I'll even buy your hoss one. He slapped his leg as he looked back to his friends who were bent over laughing and pointing at him. But Jubal kept riding. Reckon you ain't good enough, Chet, for him to drink with you, hollered one of his friends. The man stared back at Stone and pointed his bottle as if it was a gun. Shaking it, he demanded, For the last time, mister, I'm telling you to come have a drink. Stone glanced over his shoulder and waved his hand, expressing his disinterest and picked up his pace. The last thing he needed was to be tied up with an intoxicated cowpoke. His cover would surely be blown. Suddenly, a whiskey bottle came whizzing by his head. Red jumped sideways, but Jubal managed to stay square over his shoulders. He wheeled the roan around and yanked iron, ready to go at the provocator hammer and tongs. The drunk man staggered back towards his friends, indicating his reluctance to pursue stone. Jubal reached down and patted Red's neck as he pulled back on the reins. The gelding snorted, chewed at the bit, and bowed his neck. Stone shoved his pistol back into leather and whispered, Reckon the fellow has spent his powder. In another place and another time, fellow. I would have bet my colt over your skull. Stone reached the livery without incident and got Red bedded down. Then he walked back to the hotel. This time, however, as he got close to the saloons, he stayed off Main Street, sticking to the back alleys and side streets so he wouldn't be seen. He was tired from his train ride from Waco and had no interest in re-engaging the fool who had lobbed the whiskey bottle at him. Early the next morning, Jubal grabbed the bite tea at one of the diners. And then he and Red started the just over 25 mile trip to Sherwood, his destination. As he sat comfortably in the saddle, he pulled out his flute and played Red and himself a tune. The roan's ears flicked back and forth as he tore into long, fresh grass hanging out toward the edge of the road. As he moved across the middle concho bridge, a man suddenly poked his head out from a honey mesquite growing at the end of the bridge. He was young, hollow-eyed, and very thin, leading a tired-looking gray gelding. Be all right if I wrap beside you for a spell. Jubal pulled at his coat, making sure his badge wasn't visible. He didn't want to spook the fellow. Come on ahead. Reckon there's room on this road for one more. Obliged, mister. Where are you and your horse headed? Oddly, the young man's question didn't irritate Stone like the clerks had last night. Sure would. And you? Tears rolled down the boy's face. Home to see my folks in Big Lake. Name's Henry. Henry Oliver. He pulled at the poke tied behind the saddle, nestled it across his lap, and then pulled out a small piece of tobacco plug, taking a small bite before offering it to Jubal, who shook it off. I lit out when I was about fourteen. Figured I'd find my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. He chuckled as he shook his head and stared down at the ground, dismayed. What a joke. All I managed to do was make a fool out of myself. Jubal started to speak, but suddenly a stranger sitting a tall sorrel appeared on the side of the road, just a mile from where the young man had joined him. A fool is right. Your biggest mistake was riding this road without paying the toll. The big man held up a coach gun and snarled. Pointing to Jubal, he said, You and your horse have to pay to ride too, mister. But trashy friend here, well, I'm just gonna make him pay double. Henry, leaning back into his saddle, cowering in fear. Mister, if you'll let me turn around, I'll head back towards town. Not before I say howdy with this, you won't, the wannabe bandit said, shaking the short shotgun at the young man. Jubal pulled back his coat, his shiny bright marshal's badge now in clear sight. Whatever you think we owe, you might want to rethink that. Now leave us be and move on while you can. With a snarl, the bandit barked. That badge don't mean nothing to me, marshal. I'm paid to collect from everybody that comes this way. No if, ands, or buts. He pointed his tool of destruction in between Henry and Jubal, making the boy's eyes widen in horror. Now pay up. The big dirty man started his horse toward them, stopping him after a couple of steps. Jubal took advantage of the thief's moment of inattention and pitched his hat into the man's face. Grabbing the short barrel as his hat hit the man's face, he yanked it away from the big fellow. Well then, mister, looks like you and me will have to settle our hash with these, Jubal said, holding up his fists. The thief's eyes narrowed as he stared curiously at Jubal, specifically at the scar on Jubal's temple, now that his hat was off. Do I know you? Stone wondered if the man was faking his ignorance or if it was real. Something about him looked familiar to the marshal, yet different than he could remember at the moment. Then it came to him. He was not the same figure of a man as before. 
He moved slower and the light in his eyes was dim, but nonetheless, it was a train bowl he tussled with a few years back. Jubal sat by the saddle with his hand on the butt of his colt and answered, Not by name, Stanley, but a few years back you tried to do the same thing to me as you were trying to do now, except on a train. That scar, it's you! He shouted, pointing at Jubal with his mouth flung open. You were traveling with old Frank, now I remember! Stanley's demeanor suddenly changed. He scratched his head and looked to Henry, then back to Jubal. I reckon you can pass and we'll call it Squire, but for him, that will be two dollars. He held out his hand towards Henry. I've got a better idea, Stanley. Jubal raised his fists. I'll give you two of these instead. Sheriff Peel told me how you gave Frank a beating, an old man that couldn't fight back. Now you're trying to bully travelers. I've been waiting to catch up with you again. I think you need another lesson. The same one I gave you the last time we met. Jubal wrapped his reins around the horn of his saddle and started to dismount. Stanley quickly waved his hand to surrender. Now hold up there, Marshal, you're an officer of the law. You're supposed to protect people. Besides, that fall I took from the train that did me in. It took me a year to get back on my feet. By then, the railroad had fired me. Don't reckon I could survive another fight with you. Jubal leaned forward and grabbed Stanley by the shirt, pulling him close. He whispered, You're tearing my heart out. Now get before I forget I'm wearing this badge. Stanley quickly spun his mount, but as he started to ride off, he turned around in the saddle, looking at Jubal one last time. Stone gestured angrily with his head and the former railroad bolt disappeared. Henry leaned over the saddle horn and pushed out on his stirrups, letting out a long sigh of relief. <sighs> Obliged, Marshal. I reckon you just saved my life. I didn't know you were a lawman when I first met you back yonder. Glad I was here to help, Henry. Reaching for his flute, he patted it against his leg. Just wish I could have been there for Frank. He put it to his lips and began to play the tune the old hobo had taught him years ago as they rode forward. Ironically as he did, Henry dozed off to sleep in the saddle and began to snore. Jubal smiled, remembering that it was not that long ago that he was in Henry's shoes himself. A young man just trying to get back home with little money and little hope. He reached and looped his rope over Oliver's horse. When they reached Cemetery Road, Jubal and Red started to turn off, but not before handing Henry $10. Marshall Stone was now just over five miles from Sherwood and wanted to give the roan a little exercise, so he let the gelding out, giving him his head. As they approached the cemetery, he pulled the horse back to a walk, out of respect for the dead, to give them the blow. Reaching into his pocket for the paper he carried there, he reread the short letter that Judge Brewster had written and sent along with him. To who it may concern, Marshall Jubal Stone is on a highly important assignment. I would consider it a personal favor if you would give him your full cooperation. We have a serious epidemic plague in Central Texas and beyond. This is a well-funded, sophisticated group of cattle rustlers, decimating many of our Texas ranchers. These miscreants must be stopped. Please assist Marshal Stone in every way you can. Signed, Judge Leon Brewster, Waco, Texas. There was another note the judge had written for Jubal to give to Sheriff Matthew Kincaid. Brewster had FM deliver it and the other letter to Stone the night before he left for Sherwood. The judge told Deputy Marshal Miller that Jubal was welcome to read what he had written to Kincaid. Matt, I'm sending you one of Texas's finest. He's Joe Stone all over. I ain't seen him blink yet of trouble. I believe he's your huckleberry. You fellas compare notes and don't be shy about asking for resources. I got the U.S. Attorney General's ear and your governor's. Anybody who don't play marbles, just let me know. I'll have their badge and some of their hide. I sent a little sum for you with Jubal. I know how you and the missus like our buckles. Enjoy a cup for me until we can have one together. Let's rid Texas of the scourge. I got a couple of new ropes for them fools we corral. Good hunting. Your friend, Leon Brewster. Jubal smiled after reading the judge's letter. To be put in the same stall, heck, the same barn, with his paw made him proud. He couldn't wait to read Sherwood and talk to the man who knew his father firsthand. And now that he'd read the letter, he knew why the little brown bag FM handed him smelled so good. It was coffee beans, Arbuckles, some of the best coffee in the market. Stone arrived in Sherwood late that evening. He pulled up at the hitch at the jail and was quickly greeted by one of Kincaid's deputies. As he climbed down out of the saddle, he was met on the stoop with a smile. Welcome to Sherwood, Marshal Stone. I'm Deputy Tinker Johnson, but just call me Tank. Sheriff Kincaid's been expecting you. Obliged, Tank. Jubal dusted himself off and followed Tank inside. Let me grab my rifle and we'll put a shuck for the sheriff's house. He and Mrs. Kincaid are putting on a feed in your honor. 
Stone looked up and down himself. Had I known, I would have put on some better duds. Tink waved the hand. Shuck, Marshal Stone, Sheriff Kincaid's been asking for help with these cattle rustlers for a couple of months now. When he found out Judge Brewster was sending a U.S. Marshal his way, well, I reckon if you showed up in rags, you'd be welcome. Dinger walked toward the cells and locked the exterior door. We've only two in the calaboose tonight, so the regular jailer decided to take a rare night off. These two are sort of regulars, hard learners they are, but mostly harmless, and won't wake up until morning. Jubal smiled as he watched Tink scramble around the jail office collecting his plunder. Grabbing up the rifle from across the desk, he said, We'll take the buckboard across the street, in front of the sheriff's office, if it's alright with you. We can hit your mount to it and ride along together. I'm game, Tink, and I know Red would appreciate an empty saddle. He's been toting me most of a day. You reckon I ought to reserve me a room before I head out? No, sir, replied Tink straightforwardly. Jubal looked at him curiously, so Tink explained. I mean, Mrs. Kincaid said she had a room ready for you, and she wouldn't accept no for an answer. Besides, there ain't no rooms to rent here in Sherwood. <laughs> well, that's mighty nice of her. Marshal Stone, the Kincaids are some of the finest people you'll know, and they think a right smart of you. Why, the sheriff said he and your pa tamed a few towns together while they were wearing ranger badges. With a three-by-nine grin, Jubal nodded. <laughs> that's what I heard myself think. There's a couple of men, other than my pa, that I consider the gold standard. Sheriff Monty Peel of Palestine is one of them. And from what I hear from Judge Brewster, I figure Sheriff Matthew Kincaid to be another. For the next 20 minutes that it took the pair to reach Kincaid and Homestead, Stone and Tink had already become friends. Tink did most of the talking while Jubal mostly nodded. He told Jubal of his past, being on the wrong side of the law, and his future ambitions to be more than just a deputy, perhaps one day to become an attorney or a judge. That's a fine thing, Tank, and I wish you the best. Texas needs good men like you. After they had turned down the lane of the main road south of town, Jubal noticed there was a flicker of two kerosene lamps up ahead, one on each side of the doors of the house. We're here, Marshal, Tank said proudly. Jubal's heart began to race. He had been highly anticipating the meeting with Matt ever since Judge Brewster had mentioned him. The sheriff stepped out on the porch along with his wife, May. Tank brought the team to a stop. Well, I got him here, safe and sound. May? Tink tipped his hat. This here is Marshal Jubal Stone. Tink jumped down and tied off the horses. Marshal, yonder on the porch is the best lawman this side of Waco and his lovely Mrs. May. Ah, stop your blabber, Tink, you dang fool. Matt stepped down off the porch and extended his hand. Jubal quickly climbed down off the buckboard and walked his way. Welcome, Jubal, to the Slash K, the Kincaid homestead. The two men grasped each other's hands. Matt pushed Jubal away slightly. Dang, if you ain't the spitting image of old Joe. His eyes watered a bit, thinking of his friend and the way he'd been shot down. Come on over here and meet my wife, May. Mrs. Kincaid. Jubal tipped his hat and gently shook her hand. Now, Marshal, everyone around here calls me May. Yes, ma'am. May, and I'd be obliged if you'd call me Jubal. Well, Jubal it is. Come on in, the vittles are on the table. Let's eat while the bread is hot. Matt stood to the side and smiled. He couldn't believe how much Jubal favored his paw. Stone caught his stare and raised a finger. I almost forgot. He walked briskly toward the buckboard and tugged at his saddlebags. He pulled open one side and out came a small paper bag. Turning on his heels, he said, Judge Brewster wanted me to give you this. That old rascal. <laughs> Knowing him, it could be a rattler. May put her hand to her chest. Goodness, I hope not. No, ma'am. This ain't something that'll bite you. Unless you boil it up too strong, Jubal said, smiling, as he handed Matt the bag, while they climbed the five steps to the top of the porch. The aroma of the art buckles made it unnecessary to open the bag. Matt raised it to his nose. Whew, Leon sure knows what this old cowboy lacks. Yes, sir, and I've got a note that goes along with it. Jubal reached into his pocket and pulled it out. As he handed it to Matt, May waved her hand, shooing them inside and toward the dining room table. Let's eat, then you men can jaw all night about the judge if you want to. May prodded, but with a smile. Chapter 5 After polishing off a second plate of crispy golden fried potatoes and a second thick juicy steak, Jubal Stone pushed back from the table and then reached for the half-full glass of May's famous sweet tea, not returning the glass to the table until it was empty. Ma'am, uh, uh, May, this is just about the best meal I ever ate. Why, thank you, Jubal. I'm sorry, but that was the last of this batch of sweet tea, or I'd offer you more. But the coffee should be finished by now if you like some. I know Matt will drink at least two cups before bedtime. So a pawn your cup certainly won't be a bother. I just wish Tinker had stayed to eat with us. 
I worry about that boy not eating well except when it comes out on the weekends for his reading lessons. <laughs> sure thing, May. I'm like your husband. I can drink coffee about any time, especially Arbuckles. May, Tink eats three squares a day. Breakfast and lunch at Montoya's and supper with Dell when they bring the prisoners' food up. Now then, Jubal, let's you and me go home to the porch and get out of May's way of clearing the table. Besides, it's real nice out here this time of night, this time of year. Sure thing, Matt, but I'll sure help May clear the table if she'll let me. Jubal Stone, you are a guest in my home. And you're not family, at least not yet. So you'll be treated as a guest for as long as you are staying under this roof. May informed the young marshal as sweetly as she could sound. Now then, I'll bring a pot and two cups to the porch for you gentlemen, and you'll kindly remove yourselves from my dining table. She finished with a smile. Matt and Jubal sat quietly, as though neither man wanted to open the conversation. May delivered the coffee as promised and then disappeared into the house. Finally, Matt spoke. Jubal, when you crawled down from the buckboard, I could have swore it was your daddy standing before me. You stand the same, walk the same, talk the same, hell, even dress the same. Right down to that colt and rigging you wear. Your daddy's rigging, I figure? Yes, sir, it is. You know, I was just a youngster when him and my ma and sister were gunned down in cold blood. This scar on my forehead is a constant reminder of that day. But I'll never understand why I was just left with a scar and not dead. And I reckon the good Lord has something in mind he wants you to accomplish before he calls you home. To tell you the truth, I kind of figured that's why he let me live this last time I got plugged, Matt said, gazing out into the openness around them. You know, I have so many questions to ask you about my pa, but I don't really know where to start. Monty Peel told me some, but I want to find out more from a man that rode with him. That is, if you don't mind talking about those days with me. Matt smiled, chuckling before replying. Oh, well, Joe Stone was as hard a man as the last name, but as honest and fair as any man I ever knew, before and since. I was just a pup myself, home from the war and thinking all I was ever going to do was keep killing, but for a living instead of, well, whatever we was fighting for. Joe was about done with the rangers, wanting to stay home with his family and run his ranch. In fact, that ranch was just about the same size as what I got here. Then he took on that job as sheriff. Anyway, the captain paired us up, most likely to teach me some sense of the law and how to carry out the duties of a ranger. First night out, we come across a man stealing chicken and egg. Now to me, a thief was a thief, but your daddy showed me something I never expected. He let that feller off with a stern warning. Matt looked at Jubal for a moment, smiling at his attentiveness. Then he handed him a double eagle with the orders to buy some food for his family. But until he made him promise to work off the price of them eggs and laying hands and to never steal again. I thought he was crazy to let that Jasper go, but six months later, <laughs> Matt chuckled. He backed our play with a shotgun. We'd been buzzard bait if he hadn't. And that, Marshal Jubal Stone, is how I started learning the proper way to carry out the law. With mercy and compassion. For them what needs it. And firmness with them what are past helping. I reckon that's how Monty taught you. And while Leon picked you to be U.S. Marshal, because you're your daddy all over again, if you want to know what kind of man he was. If you want to know all about him, just look in the mirror, son. And in here, Kincaid pointed to his chest. You'll find Joe Stone sitting right there, staring back. Jubal crossed his arms and slowly sat back in his chair, speechless, trying to absorb what Matt Kincaid had just said about him being his father all over again, and that the answers he was looking for were within him, just for the looking. Matt, why do you figure Cable Lane and them other three curs came after Pa? Why they killed Ma and Mary? And why they tried to kill me? Matt scratched his head and closed one of his eyes. All I could ever figure out was they made a pact in jail to kill Joe as soon as they could get out. Blaming your daddy for them getting caught instead of blaming themselves for breaking the law. Why'd they kill your mother and sister and try to kill you? Figured to leave no witnesses, plain and simple. But they did leave a witness. One that will be the death of every single one of them. I hear you already tried to take Lane in and it didn't end well for him. That's right, Matt, said Jubal as he looked to his new friend. Jess Harkins, a batch killer, braced me and paid the price. Before he did, he told me Lane and Tobias Fletcher was like brothers. I've been hunting Fletcher and have been told he's maybe down in the Austin area, but that's all I ever heard. Yeah, that's what I heard too, Jubal. But I ain't buying it. He just kind of disappeared after it was learned that you survived, like he knew what was coming. Of course, there was a pass of lawmen hunting him also. I'd have been right there with them, but I had just left the rangers, married May, and she was due with our first baby. I figured I was needed here, to home, a lot more than I was needed on the trail on them no accounts. 
Sorry, Jubal. Don't be, Matt. You're right. May needed you here. Matt answered without divulging that they had lost that child, not wanting to open that wound again. I'm glad you feel that way, Jubal. It's just how your daddy would have viewed it. You know who the mother two was? No, sir, not really. At least not for certain. Besides Fletcher and Lane, there was Jack Tanner and the other one you stuck with the pitchfork, Marty Goforth. It was all in the court records, but I'll never understand why the records were sealed after that trial. Well, as it turned out, what I heard was that Goforth didn't make it. Died from that stab and you gave him. I hear he suffered real bad at the end, but died without a second's remorse. Tanner got himself caught up in the territories, rustling cattle off the Chickasaw lands. They promptly hung him and then sent for the Indian police. That just leaves Tobias Fletcher, the worst of that bunch. Even worse than Cable Lane, if that's possible, but I figure Fletcher had changed his name and his looks as much as he could. But just because a man changes his name and looks doesn't mean he stops being a criminal. I'll figure he'll always be among the willows dodging the law. Jubal looked disappointed. He had hoped to round up all of his family's killers and pay them back for the devilment. I appreciate you filling me in on Goforth and Tanner. I'm glad they're dead, but I had hoped to be the one to... Well, you know? Jubal took a deep breath. <sighs> Matt, I firmly believe that Fletcher is somehow connected to this ring of cattle rustling that has become such a problem. From what we learned on our end, this enterprise has been operated all over Texas. And by some powerful players. Kincaid shifted in his chair. Well, I can tell you that we managed to snag a few of the men on the ground, but about the only thing we've learned is that the buyer is a feller named Albert Dillingham. He's pretty shadowy, but that I can tell you for sure. At first, we thought he was a cattle buyer out of Chicago, but it turns out he's got an office in Fort Worth and buys cattle from an outfit in Omaha, run by an R.W. Wilcox. We think shipping them back here as fast as he can get them loaded into cattle cars. It was Dillingham to put out the bounty on me, so you gotta know I want that bugger bad. Matt cracked his knuckles and stared at Jubal. You have a description of this Dillingham? Asked Stone curiously. Yeah, not really. Seems the only fella alive near here that was actually seeing him didn't get a real good look. Not to tell you that he's a mute. That is a tongue cut out by Jip Chalker after him and his bunch killed the boy's family. Good kid, Matthias Crocker. Under probation and riding with my Comanche deputy, Hawk Sterling. Speaking of Hawk, he ought to be in sometime tomorrow. Hawk is already in town as a Lilo, and you met Tinker. Del Compton, another old ranger, is my jailer, but he took his first night off since I hired him. But you'll meet him in the morning. Only one missing is Cricket Cochran, another former ranger, and if I figure it right, he'll be in tomorrow as well. We'll head for the office in the morning and gather them all up for a powwow as soon as they all show. That's a lot of law for a small county, and a new one at that. Dang, I'm only one deputy marshal in Waco. Matt chuckled. County Judge Robert Mason is behind that, Jubal. Not that we don't have need for all of them, because we do. At least for now. And I'll make certain that every single one of them knows that what you say goes. Just like they keep taking orders from me directly. What I'll ask of you is to keep me informed on what's going on. We got our telegraph office installed, so now we can communicate with any other agency we need to reach out to. I don't give a hoot how far this reaches or who's behind it or where we have to go to take them down. I'm just now getting to where I can set a saddle again, but I'm ready to ride anytime, anywhere. As Matt finished speaking, Jubal could tell the sheriff was on the prod and that nothing was going to stand in his way of getting to the culprits behind his getting shot, no matter who they were. He just hoped that, somehow, Tobias Fletcher was among them and that he could finally get his showdown with the man who was responsible for the killing of his family and the scar across his forehead. He decided it was time to let Matt know he was in complete agreement about going anywhere and taking out anyone connected to the wrestling ring, and that he had a vendetta to settle with Fletcher. Matt, I agree completely. And not just because they're also issued a bounty on me or shot you, but because they are lawbreakers of the First Order. A syndicate, if you will, but a criminal syndicate. Texas ranchers are having a hard go of it, and these Jaspers are making it even tougher for them to survive. But Matt, I had to let you know something. Jubal frowned and his eyes narrowed. If Tobias Fletcher is involved, and I believe him to be, I can't promise he'll live to go to jail. Jubal patted his daddy's cold on his side. Figure to let Paws 44 do some barking and biting. Understood, Joe. I'm sorry, did I just call you Joe? <laughs> I reckon it's because you remind me of him so much. Now then, I can't say I blame you one bit concerning Fletcher. 
And if it comes to that, I'm sure I ain't going to stand in your way. In fact, I'll back your pillow every step of the way. I reckon you had a powerful long day and, and likely need a good night's rest for a change. Let's get some shut-eye and take this up again in the morning. Sounds mighty fine to me, Matt. And you're right, it's been a long day. Matt rose from his chair and waved a hand. Follow me and I'll show you to your bunk. Morning comes early round here, and it's customary for even guests to help out with chores for May will feed us. But we do get a cup of coffee first, Matt said with a chuckle. This suits me just fine, Matt. Lead the way. Jubal picked up his Winchester and saddlebags from where Tinker had placed them beside the door. Thankful that the youngster had also stripped bread, putting up his saddle and bridle, and turned the roan out into the corral, making sure the horse was grained along with getting a generous portion of hay. He'd remember to thank Tinker the next morning, maybe finding something special to give the young deputy just to let him know he was appreciated. Inside, Jubal was shown to a room near the front of the house, handed an oil lamp, and left alone. Pulling off his boots, he decided he'd better strip down and put on a clean union suit before he crawled into May's clean sheets. Finally getting to lie down, he pulled the wool blanket up to his chin, and then lay there looking at the ceiling, not able to fall asleep. Jewel's mind was ablaze with the new information he had gained from Sheriff Matt Kincaid, not only about his father, but the men who gunned down Joe Stone and his family. The young marshal continued to be disappointed that Goforth and Tanner were deceased, but found some solace that each had met his fate. Jubal really had no idea what time it was when he finally fell asleep. He just knew it seemed like just a few minutes before an unfamiliar male voice called out. Marshal Stone, time to rise and shine. Coffee's on and the chores is awaiting. I'll be right there. Jubal responded but didn't move for several minutes, remembering where he was and how well he was being treated. Batting his eyes open to keep from going back to sleep, he finally swung out of bed and got dressed, stomping into his boots and finding his way to the kitchen by following the smell of bacon and coffee and the sounds of voices, pleasant voices. Stepping into the kitchen, Jubal said, Morning, folks. Looking around, he saw May at the stove, Matt at the head of the table, and four new faces sitting with him. Two men and two beautiful women, one of them quite pregnant and the second one showing. Jubal, these are my boys, he pointed at them. Luke and John, and their wives, Becky and Marjorie. Pull up a chair and strap on the feed bag, Matt said, pointing to the only empty chair left. These boys done the chores already before they even called you and before I even crawled out of bed myself. Pa, we'll be out on the porch, me and John, and the girls will be in the living room till y'all finish eating. That way Ma can have a seat as well, Luke said, standing up. Matt nodded as the other three people also stood, and all four left the kitchen. Jubal, just so you know, them boys, their wives, and the girls' daddy are all members of my sheriff's policy. As well as May here. We can call on them to help out in any situation we might find ourselves in. I'll also say this. They can all ride and shoot with the best of them, and better than most. Matt raised his fork toward the corral. Say, I was admiring that red roan of yours. Fine looking animal. Looks like the kind that has a never ending bottom and all the speed you'd ever need, am I right? Before Jubal could answer, Matt continued. Reminds me of the blue roan Joe rode, and that big bulldog of jaw hoss was a tad taller than your red. Long legged critter, to be sure. Suddenly, the memory of Jubal's father's horse flooded his mind and his senses. The long-forgotten recollection of that big blue roan came back so strongly that he could almost smell the animal's sweat on a hot day and his warm breath on his face. Barnabas. Barney, for short. Pa said he was the best horse he'd ever ridden. Claimed the blue owned him, not the other way around. <laughs> Ride his rain, Jubal. Now, I had me a fine horse back then, but he didn't hold a candle to Barney. But you know what? I've been breeding horses with that same kind of stamina and speed. And now I got me some that'll run till they drop in with jackrabbit speed. And talk about heart. I lost one recently, a blue roan we call Blue. He took a bullet meant for me about two miles from here. But he never faltered till he got me home. Then he dropped dead right out there by the corral. You find the shooter, Matt? You bet I did. Managed to get a shot into the varmint and we tracked him to where he'd die the next morning. In fact, that's the first place I got the hint of Dillingham's name from a dying man. Matthew O'Ryan Kincaid, that's enough of that. Let Jubal eat his breakfast. Here, honey, spoon some of these potatoes into your plate. Then help yourself to the bacon and eggs before everything gets cold. Biscuits should be out in another minute or so. As Jubal sat eating, even more memories came floating back into his mind. May's cooking reminded him of his mother's cooking, and her wanting the table to be quiet of any talk but that of family seemed to be the way he remembered his ma wanted it. Even having fresh milk at the table reminded him of home. The home that seemed so long ago and so far away. Being with Matt and May took him back to a softer time. 
almost like being a member of a family again. May's words from the night before now rang in his ears. You're not family, at least not yet. But this morning he felt as if now he was a part of the Kincaid family. And it sure felt satisfying. Matt took a last gulp of coffee and wiped his mouth with the cloth in his lap. Jubal, if you're ready, we best get saddled up and mounted. Martha will be at the office by eight, and Della Tank will have the coffee on the boil by then. Jubal hurried down the last sip of his coffee and pushed away from the table. Ready whenever you are, Matt. He stepped over and with a big smile put his hand in Mrs. Kincaid's shoulder. May, thank you for such a fine meal. He patted his belly. Been a spell since I ate like this or enjoyed it so much. With tears in his eyes, he finished his thought. And that was around the table with my family back on our ranch. Jubal, you're certainly welcome. And please know that there will always be room around a table for you. And consider our house your house. It's been a real pleasure having you here, even just for a night. For years, I've heard stories from Matt about your pa. He was quite a bull of the woods. Come back and see us soon. She took his hand from her shoulder and kissed it. Before Jubal could respond, Luke, standing at the door, said, Pa, figured you'd want a smooth ride, so I saddled up a buck for you. Marshall Stone, yours is ready to ride as well. There's a mighty fine animal you're riding just as fine as any we got here. Thanks, Luke. He was a gift from a dear friend of mine, Sheriff Monty Peel. Jubal looked at the sheriff. Matches, let me grab my bed, roll and saddle bags, and we can light a shuck for town. Thirty minutes later, they were sitting in Matt's office drinking coffee, waiting for the deputies to start assembling for their meeting to discuss what each has information about the wrestlers and who could possibly be behind it. Martha and Jubal hit it off immediately, and Jubal had to admit that Matt Kincaid, as sheriff of Irene County, had assembled the finest staff he had seen anywhere in his travels so far. Now he knew why Judge Brewster had sent him the mat, as he would likely accomplish more using this as a starting point than anywhere else he could have started. Chapter 6 Marshal Jubal Stone and Sheriff Kincaid, along with Kincaid's deputies and Judge Mason, spent the afternoon hammering out a plan to bring down the cattle rustling syndicate. In the next few days, Sherwood's deputies, along with other lawmen across the state, would be dispatched to six different gathering spots where the cattle were being collected and railed. Over the next two weeks, information was collected and processed by the lawmen and sent back to Sherwood. Through special telegraph codes, it was determined that a shipment of stolen cattle was headed to Omaha. Marshal Stone and Sheriff Kincaid caught the train out of Fort Worth and rode it all the way into Omaha. Along the way, there were several towns where the train stopped, and their lives were threatened by numerous gunmen. But finally, they arrived in Omaha where a standoff awaited them. Tobias Fletcher had taken one of Kincaid's deputies hostage and forced Marshal Stone and Sheriff Kincaid and a host of other lawmen, Marshal Bigelow of Omaha, his deputies, and three Texas Rangers, to let him and his hostage go. Jubal climbed aboard a fast horse on loan from Marshal Bigelow and rode out alone after Deputy Tank and Tobias Fletcher. He wasn't coming back without at least one of them. After some hard riding and helpful tips from people along the way, he found Deputy Tinker Johnson alive, but barely. Tink was hanging from his feet and struggling to stay conscious. Jubal cut him down and got him to a local doctor as quick as he could. Over the next couple of weeks, Jubal stayed close to Tink and Sheriff Kincaid until they were healed up a bit and able to travel back home to Sherwood. Under the federal mandate of Judge Leon Brewster of Waco, Texas, Marshal Jubal Stone and a band of lawmen had successfully put an end to the interstate cattle rustling ring. Arrests were made, and as Brewster had once told Jubal, it was indeed surprising just how far-reaching the syndicate was. Politicians, railroad executives, gunslingers, bankers, and a slew of others, including dirty lawmen, were taken into custody and prosecuted. Tobias Fletcher's escape irritated Judge Brewster and the other lawmen who worked so hard to collar him but nobody was more affected by his getting away than Jubal Stone. Jubal telegraphed Brewster from Omaha and told the judge his plan to leave immediately in the hunt for Fletcher, now that Tink and Kincaid were out of the woods. However, Judge Brewster, to Stone's disappointment, had different plans for the marshal. Upon receiving Brewster's telegram, Stone said his goodbyes to Sheriff Kincaid, May, his wife, and Deputy Tink Johnson in Omaha, and boarded a train for Waco. Judge Brewster needed him to testify in a number of pending court cases that were quickly backing up. He also had numerous warrants that needed to be executed on the kingpins of the multi-state cattle wrestling ring. Stone wanted worse than anything to stay after Fletcher while his trail was hot, but Leon Brewster was not having it. He ordered Stone back to Waco pronto. 
Jubal stepped off the train in Fort Worth as and pulled into the station just long enough to personally bring his friend, Sheriff Harold Rigby, up to speed on the arrests they had made and the progress they were making in the cattle rustling sting. As he walked into Rigby's office, Harold quickly got up and closed the door behind him. Jubal Stone, wasn't expecting you, but dang glad you're here. I want to hear about the bust in Omaha, but first things first. He pulled on his gun belt and took a shotgun from a young, wide-eyed, stocky-framed deputy who stepped over to him with weapons in each hand. Say howdy to Dan Hall, one of my deputies, he gestured with his head. Dan, this is Marshal Stone, I know. Pleased to meet you, sir, Hall said as he extended his hand and offered a noteworthy shake. Jubal always liked a fellow with a firm grip versus a dead fish. Dan, my pleasure. I've heard a lot about you, Marshal. Jubal grinned. Believe about half of that deputy. Rigby cleared his throat and reached for his hat. We've been hunting down and arresting most of these rustlers connected to these Omaha bunch. Most of them gun slicks on wanted posters we found. Had three different posses come in the outskirt of Fort Worth for that sorry lot. We've only taken two in alive. The others have fought us like Kilkenny cats. Got one backed up in a draw about two miles west of town, the last of the bunch. The worst, too. He's wounded two of my men. One is on a lone limb and may not make it. Through gritted teeth, Rigby raised his fist. I want this man. Who is he, Harold? Do you know? Hall handed Jubal a poster. This fellow here, Marshal. Gus Giles, Stone said under his breath as he shook his head and stared at the paper in his grip. Figured you know him, Jubal, by that grimace on your face, said Rigby suspiciously. Looks like you bit into a green persimmon. Yep, he's a dead shot with the Winchester. Three rangers had him corralled in a waddy outside of El Dorado about six months ago. He killed one of them and shot the horses out from under the other two. Wagging his head, Rigby spat. Badge killer and a horse killer. Just as he said those words, there was a knock on his door. Come on in. It was the mayor of Fort Worth. Sheriff, Ernie didn't make it. I'm sorry to have to tell you that. Thank you, Mayor Thomas. Rigby acknowledged sadly. Thomas nodded and pulled close the door as he exited. Sheriff Rigby was furious. That's two lawmen he killed. Ernie was a good man. He just got married three weeks ago. Harold, said Jubal with a foreboding tone. Giles shot them horses out from under those rangers at 400 yards. And he's even better with a pistol. Stone looked at Rigby, then to Hall. Rigby rubbed his chin and stared toward the marshal. Got time to join us, Jubal? Stone pulled his watch from his vest. I do, Harold. Figure I owe you one anyhow. Dan, I reckon I'll need the loan of one of them rifles on the wall and a hoss. See if this one here fits your hand, Marshal. He pitched the Winchester in the air and Jubal caught it. Then Dan turned on his heel and retrieved another. Jubal, one of them bays you and Kincaid rode before suit you. You bet. Dan, hightail it over to delivery and have Dilbert saddle bullet. Tell him to include a boot for a raffle. On it, Sheriff. Dan bolted out the door and door delivery. The heavy sound of his boots pounding the boardwalk echoed loudly, then faded off. The three lawmen climbed aboard their mounts and rode hard towards Stillman's draw. They stopped a thousand yards away, where Jubal then split off from the sheriff and deputy. Less than ten minutes later, a bullet whizzed directly over Stones' head. He lay flat against his saddle and gigged the gelding with his spurs, reining him into the nearby mesquite trees, trying to keep him and his horse safe from the deadly bore of Giles' Winchester. Jubal quickly dismounted and cupped his hands to his mouth. You're under arrest, Gus Giles. This is Marshal Jubal Stone. Drop your weapons, throw up your hands, and come out in the open. Well, Marshal Jubal Stone, we wanted to meet you. Figure we got something to settle between us. Suddenly, two shots rang out from the draw. Someone from the posse had tried to get a little closer to the outlaw and paid the price. Best tell him, fellas, I'll kill them all before I surrender. Tell them to get to riding or I'll kill them and their horses. Jason's hit, Sheriff Rigby! Someone yelled out in the distance. Giles chuckled loudly. Like shooting fish in a barrel, Stone. What's it gonna take, Giles, to end this? Asked Jubal. You and me, face to face. Cold to cold, I reckon. Stone thought for a minute, then stepped out of cover. All right, throwing my rifle out now. You do the same. Not before you tell them law dogs to pitch theirs and mount their horses and ride. Rigby heard the exchange between Jubal and Giles and whispered, Hope we ain't about to lose another Texas lawman. 
Them like stone is hard to come by. From what I heard about Marshal Stone, Sheriff, he might be the only one in Texas right now who can take gals in a gunfight, said Dan as he glassed across the landscape to find the posse. Jubal cupped his hands. This is Marshal Jubal Stone of Waco. Every man hunt gals gather your wounded, leave your guns where they are, and ride. Sheriff Rigby sent me here. Now do as I say and quickly. Giles chuckled loudly, his laughter ringing out across the draw. <laughs> yeah, look at them scatter. All right, Giles, said Jubal. Give them safe passage out of here. Then you and I will settle our hash. Rigby and Hall stayed where they were so as not to give away their position. They watched as four men hauled one of their wounded to where the horses were tied. Then they pushed him up into the saddle in front of one of the riders and they left the scene. Giles stepped out from cover. All right, Marshal. Looks like it's just you and me. Stone stepped forward to engage his opponent. Lord, I don't want to kill this man. And I don't want him killing me. But this is the only way I know to stop this madness. Give me a fast hand. And a good shot. As the men moved toward one another, both did so cautiously, with their hands hovering closely over their pistols. Sure you won't change your mind and give up, gals? Asked Stone. Why, for a rope? I reckon not. Sides, I never lost a gunfight. Never. Got me seven notches on my pistol. I kill you. I just might notch too, given your reputation. Giles laughed nervously as he moved forward. Heard you let Fletcher get away. Could do the same for me. Not hardly, Giles. And I ain't finished hunting old Tobias. He'll be bedded down soon enough. What kind of gun you toting yonder? Asked Gus. Be glad to show you. Of course, time I do, I don't figure you'll be any shape to see it. This forty-four makes a sizable hole in a feller. Rigby and Hall watched through the field glasses with intense anticipation, hoping Jubal Stone had not met his match with his highbinder. Stone and Giles were over six hundred yards away, so even if Giles did gun Jubal, he would be well out of range for the sheriff and his deputy, thus escaping justice. The men continued to ease up to one another as they were avoiding a hidden bear trap, both moving toward the flat until each suddenly stopped and widened his stance. Stand aside and let me pass, Stone. That's the only way you'll live past today. I'm taking you in, gals. For killing that ranger and deputy and for cattle wrestling. Pig or pork, your choice. Gals turned slightly to his right as if looking behind him. Stone knew exactly what he was doing having seen this stride several times by other gunmen. He pulled his forty four the moment the killer turned back. Both men's guns rang out. Jubal went to his knees with his pistol still raised at his opponent. Gus smiled as if he had won until blood began pouring out of the corner of his mouth. Suddenly, he began to stagger forward, grasping his chest with one hand and holding his colt with the other. Then he fell dead, face down, just a few feet from Jubal. Rigby and Hall raced through their horses, then toward Jubal. They rode as close as the terrain would allow them, then dismounted and ran to Jubal, who was leaning forward, retrieving Giles' gun, staring with disgust at the notches on the butt. Dan got the stone first. Marshal, Marshal, are you all right? Jubal nodded and reached into his pocket with his bloody hand and pulled out his knife. Then he carved two notches in the handle of his gun. That's for them. That ranger and deputy. Gals murdered. An eye for an eye, Gals. An eye for an eye. Rigby grabbed for his bandana and quickly bent down and began wrapping stones his wounded leg. Dang, Jubal, you took a powerful chance bracing Gals. Hall spoke up. I figured it was Giles who took the chance. I knew you would take him, Marshal Stone. Jubal stuck out his bloody hand. Thanks, Bart. Hall proudly shook it. Now, if you fellas would get me back to Fort Worth, I figured to get doctored and climbed aboard that southbound train. Looks to me like the bullet went straight through, said Jubal as he glared at his gnarly bullet-ripped knee. Blood didn't even seem to bother the Marshal even though it was his own. If I ain't back to Waco in a couple of days, I'll have to answer to Judge Leon Brewster. He looked down to Giles' lifeless body. He'd make Gus there look like a lamb. The three of them chuckled. It was some much-needed levity for the several days' attention from the standoff with Giles. Guns slicked lots of them. Always think they're faster than the next man, said Rigby as he looked down to the corpse. The fact is, Giles knew what he was facing. The judge has done handed down hanging sentences to all the rustlers that had been corralled in this ring. That's why he fought so hard. 
About three hours after getting back to Fort Worth and getting tended by the doctor, Juba boarded the train for Brownwood, the place where he and Sheriff Kincaid had left their horses a few weeks previously, when they hopped the northbound to Omaha. Jubal slept most of the way back to Comanche, the last stop before Brownwood, thanks to a strong dose of laudanum, the same pain-killing medication the doctor had given Sheriff Kincaid to help him manage his sore ribs. As the train jerked to a stop, Jubal awoke, pulled up on the back of the seat, and stood for a moment before stepping out into the aisle to disembark for a cup of coffee and some vittles. Soon the train whistle sounded. All aboard for Brownwood! Stone struggled to his feet and made his way toward the depot. His knee was starting to throb and burn, so he took his time getting back to the train and to his seat. Two hours to Brownwood, yelled the conductor. About an hour into the trip, he dozed off until someone sitting across from him started talking. As he pushed his hat up above his eyes, he blinked a couple of times before realizing the train had arrived in Brownwood. As he stepped out into the aisle and made his way down to the steps, he heard a familiar, gravelly voice. How about a ride to the singer, Marshal? It was Al Ketchum, one of Sheriff Charlie Bell's Brownwood deputies, a friendly face and a welcome sat to Jubal. I'd be obliged, deputy. Mind stopping up to the livery first. I'm going to look in on my horse. Done. Al jumped down from the buckboard and helped Jubal get up in the seat. You run into a buzzsaw since you left Omaha. Yep, one by the name of Gus Giles. (laughs) Dang, Marshal. Gotta hand it to you. You have a knack for drawing out the hard cases. Giles have done this devilment all across the frontier. He's killed quite a few men. So he told me. Jubal pulled back his coat and grabbed the colt tucked in his belt. Seven to be exact. Stone held up the butt of the gun and showed Ketchum the notches guiled the card in the handle. Al chuckled. <laughs> Figure he's sleeping about now. According to my ma, they don't do much sleeping where he is. Say, how's Sheriff Bell getting along with the rest of his deputies? Well... Ketchum pushed up in the brim of his hat. After coming across a couple of dirty deputies under his employ that were linked to the cattle rustling, he was like a Kansas twister. He combed through the rest of us deputies, making certain no other badges were tarnished. Can't abide a lawman gone bad. Why do they ever put the badge on if they're not going to honor the office? Ireland's I reckon, Marshal. Just men drawing wages instead of honoring the badge. Whoa. Al said as he pulled up on the reins of the team arriving at the livery. Tom Wilkes, the livery owner, met the pair out front. Marshal Stone, is it? Yes, sir, Mr. Wilkes. How are you getting along? Well, he pointed to Jubal's Ravney, <laughs> better than you. Stone and Ketchum chuckled. Reckon you want to take a gander at your gelding? Yes, sir, I sure do. Jubal grimaced and put his leg over the side of the buckboard, attempting to get down. Wilkes held up his hand. Hold up now, Marshal. Ain't no use in dismounting. I'll drive him around back. The roan is in the corral. Oblige, Tom. I'll get square with you in the morning on what I owe. Whew. My plans are to pull out in the southbound to Waco after breakfast. I'll have him ready for you, Marshal. Jubal waved as Ketchum pulled away. Behind the barn, Jubal found the gelding munching on hay as he stood three-legged in the corral with a couple of other horses. Red whinnied when he heard Jubal whistle and walked toward the buckboard sticking his head over the top rail. Feels like Tom is taking good care of you, boy. The gelden sniffed and nibbled at Jubal's hand as Stone leaned over the buggy. Smiling, Jubal said, Your loafing days are just about over. Best enjoy yourself. You'll be wearing leather soon enough and toting me. The marshal looked at the deputy. Ready when you are, Al. Jubal had supper with Deputy Ketchum. As they were finishing up their meals, Sheriff Bell walked in and joined them for coffee. Arbuckles. To Mac Kincaid and the deputies of Sherwood, said Jubal as he held up his cup. Here, here, to Kincaid and his deputies. Figure the two of you would have traveled back this way together. Matt was in bad shape when we got to Omaha. Had surgery on his ribs, but I figure the next few days he and his wife May will come through Brownwood traveling home. Judge Brewster ordered me to Waco as soon as I get there. Bell took a gulp of his coffee and set down his cup. Jubal, I heard what Fletch had done to that young deputy. Tink, I believe, was his name. It's a miracle you found him alive. Now having to call off the hunt before you treed your coon, seems like you got the muddy end of the stick, hoss. I'm just telling you how I see it. Yep, but like Kincaid said at Omaha, federal judge outranks a marshal every day of the week, even Sundays. From what I hear, 
said Ketchum as he pushed his hat around on the table with his hand. With that kind of price on his head, he's a dead man walking. Yep, spoke with one of them painted ladies Sledger did wrong. She and her, uh, madams had matched the judge's $50,000 reward. Then why the funeral face, Jubal? With that kind of loot on his head, I may turn in my badge and go hunt me in myself, Sheriff Bell smiled. He's sure to be roped, branded, and skinned for sure. His days are numbered. Al joined the conversation with a grin. Dang, Charlie, you ain't leaving down without me. <laughs> Jubal continued to look disjointed. What's eating you, Marshal Stone? That kind of money's going to get a lot of good people killed. I ain't worried so much about the bounty hunters. It's the farmers, merchants, and town people that will take up the gun after Fletcher. I hadn't thought about it like that, Jubal, said Bell. But I'm afraid you're right. The waitress brought the bill. The sheriff quickly took it in hand as she was placing it on the table. Thanks, Kate, he said with a smile. Jubal, your meal's on me. The ketchup slowly looked at Bell with a crooked grin. They go for mine too, Charlie. <laughs> I reckon so. Bell stood up and put out his hand. Take care of yourself, Marshal, and come back and see us soon. Jubal stood and grimaced in pain from the wound to his knee. A blatch. Charlie, for all you and your boys did for me and Matt a few weeks ago. Ever down Waco Way, hope to return the favor. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Jubal Stone, U.S. Marshal, Eye for an Eye, by Casey Nash.